oh, just working with him, like sometimes I pinch myself and think, I've been so blessed. Mm. Like the things that I feel like my life has been going through and what people don't know and what people do know. And, and then one day being able to work with someone so iconic. Yeah. Just, yeah, just maybe like, sometimes I put like my friends play the song and I'm like, oh my God, that's me. That it's happened. me. Like that actually yeah. happened. Yeah. But I literally just knew how to kind of make it out like I was, perfectly fine and I think that's why a lot of people used to always look at me and be like oh god she's like this she's like that it's because they just had no understanding that in my head <clears throat> I was in my own world it was such a struggle to get myself to where I am now and it just went on and on and on for many many years and I just remember thinking mm, I just cannot wait to the day I feel free this episode does touch on difficult subjects including depression and anxiety if you or someone you know is struggling with mental health, you can contact Samaritans 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Call 116-123 or email jo, that's joe, at samaritans.org. Hello and welcome to Shaping Success, a brand new and very exciting podcast from Simply Be, all about women at the top of their game with me, Fleur East. As a singer and broadcaster, I'm inspired by women who push boundaries, women who have carved a different path to society's stereotypes, women who refuse to fit in. And I want to find out who and what shaped their journey to success. So in this podcast series, I'm joined by female icons from all walks of life to talk about their inspirations, heroes, and the moments that change them. We'll hear from some of the biggest female names and the ones you might know less about as they share their remarkable stories of determination and dedication and reveal the moments and icons that have shaped them along the way. Ultimately, our guests all have one thing in common. They're killing it. So let's meet them. Today, I'm joined by a musician whose songs were the soundtrack to my teenage years. As one third of one of Britain's most successful girl bands, The Sugar Babes, Muti Abuena is a singer-songwriter who knows more than most about what it takes to make a hit record. After years of success in the early 2000s, followed by a solo career of her own, she's reunited with her original bandmates to bring The Sugar Babes back to centre stage. Over 25 years on from their formation, her songs are still loved and listened to worldwide. So what's the key to making music that lasts? I'm excited to find out. Welcome to Shaping Success, Muti Abuela. Thank you. I'm so excited. I'm very nervous. But yeah, no, I'm really excited to be here with you. Yeah, me too. Because no. like I said, we were literally in the playground doing dance routines to your songs. Funny. It's so funny when you say 25 years, I'm like, ooh. <laughs> You're like, ooh, a lot has happened. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you because I want to learn about you before right. the Sugar Babes. Mm -hmm. like, what were you like as a child growing up? What kind of child were you? Oh my God, so I've always been singing and dancing. I actually started dancing before singing. Oh. Um, I used to be in like a, a Filipino dance school. So I used to do Hawaiian and Filipino traditional dancing. Like oh. I traveled Europe from the age of nine. Yeah, literally went everywhere before I even had gone anywhere with the sugar babes. So I was doing all of that. And then I realized I had a little voice. And I, then I started getting invites to Filipino parties <laughs> and I was the girl that would sing at everyone's party um <laughs> till about maybe sorry, 10 11 um and then yeah and then I met my manager um when I was like go at 10 and 11. So how did you even get into dance how did that start? So I used to go to like a Filipino traditional school on every weekend ah okay um so yeah my dad had me there. <laughs> He's like, right, this is what you're going to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'd be there and um, every Saturday and Sunday, I'd be like uh, from like 8 a.m. to about 3, 4, doing just where it'd be like traditional Filipino dancing, Hawaiian or jazz, tap dance, ballet. Yeah. You had like a full on career before really the Sugar Babes even happened. I really, really did. At the yeah. age of nine. At the age of nine. <laughs> and I was traveling the whole of Europe. Um, to like different places like Filipino cultures and stuff in like Rome, all over Italy, all over Spain, like yeah, just everywhere. That's fascinating to mm -hmm. me. I had no idea about that. Mm -hmm. So you you started in the Sugar Babes at 13? Wow, I, I started when I was 
well, we got signed when I was 13. Yeah. We we released when I was 14. Uh. But I just turned 11 when we had, when I had met our manager at that time. 11 years old. I know, I know. Now when I think about, oh, what the hell is this? Do you think like having your, your mini career before the Sugar Babes, like when you were touring Europe and everything, doing I your Filipino yeah. dancing, do you think that prepared you for that? I think it did. To be honest, like I've never been a shy one when it comes to going onto the stage. Um, I still get nervous, mm. like even till this day. But um, yeah, I think it helped a lot. It helped a lot. And yeah, it kind of got me to where I am now, I guess. So what was it like then from the age of 11, like when you met your manager, you signed a deal and everything. Mm -hmm. like what was that like progression like from that age until the moment where you finally like released music? Oh my God. So I just remember just being in the studio till like five, six in the morning, um, getting dressed in the car to go to school. Like me and Keisha in, in the back of the car, getting dressed in our school uniforms, going straight to school from studio. And then it, got, it became so much eventually that we both got kicked out. <laughs> wow, yeah. so hold on, what age is this then when you're this going like to school? This is like year eight, so I'm saying like maybe about 12, 13. Wow. But then um, we had we had to get tut tutored, so that kind of helped. And then we released our first single when I was 14, Keisha was 15, mm -hmm. and Siobhan. And that was, yeah, from there it was kind of just a, a roll on. So, sorry, so you got kicked out of school yeah. at what, the age of 12? 12, 13. How did your parents react to that? To be honest, what <laughs> it was is that my I always had a parent around me because I was the youngest, so I always had like a chaperone. Mm. Um, my dad would be driving us. Obviously getting kicked out was a bit of a, uh, my dad was like, mm. but then my career, I was like, well, dad, I want to do this. And he was like, all right, we'll take this chance. And I think that was like all of our parents, they all took the chance because they knew that we was in good hands. And then we were promised tutorial. So obviously from that, obviously that kind of helped out a lot. And then, yeah, as soon as school was finished, we just concentrated on, on our careers. Wow. And so by the age of 17, I was like, yeah, I'm moving out of my house. I'm going, yeah. You're moving out of your house yeah, at I 17. <laughs> I did. I really, really did. But I've always been very independent. I think being, doing so many things from the youngest age, my dad's always said to me, like, you are literally, you've always wanted to do everything by yourself. Mm. So I think when, as soon as I found my feet, and my mom knew, my mum and dad knew that I was quite responsible, so it was fine. So I was like, yeah, I'm going. But I was only around the corner, literally. <laughs> You're like, mine, I'm just up the With road. my girls. I lived with two, like, older girls. <laughs> You're like, I still come around for food. Oh, always. <laughs> I had them come around cooking for me, it's fine. <laughs> that is so crazy to me. I'm trying to, like, imagine what that would be like at that age. Like, at the age of nine, you started touring yeah. Europe. Then you got signed at like 11. Then mm. you left school at like 12. 12, 13, yeah. And then you were already successful. Like, how do you think that shaped you as a person? Like, not really having, I guess, like the stereotypical childhood. It was hard because we've kind of grown up in the industry and everyone to watch us from from the age of 14. Mm. So my whole life has been literally out there. So it's I've, I've kind of got used to it, really. Um, but I feel like we missed out on things like I really wanted to go college and university. Mm. That was the things that I really wished I had done. Unfortunately, there was no time to actually do it. Um, but then I feel like at the same time, I'm very blessed and very grateful. Oh, yeah. Do you know what I mean? But I do wish I, I kind of went to more family functions like birthdays and, you know, missed out on I've got a big, big family. So I missed out on like certain times of birthdays and mm. my new nieces being born or nephews being born. I wasn't there for that. We're good. Wow. So oh, yeah. you signed, you released music at the age of 14. Mm -hmm. You're out of school now. So you moved out of your house when you were when 17. I was 17. And then you had a child at 20. Yes, I did. Wow. And we are the closest ever. Like we're literally 20 years gap between each other. We go out wow. together. We do everything together. She's actually going on her first holiday tomorrow. So I'm really nervous. <gasps> Um, yeah, life was just very, very different. Mm. I feel like um, I feel like it's so, it was different, but it's so normal for me. Yeah, like I don't know any better to be honest, or any different. Well, yeah, your daughter's Talia, right? Yeah. How old is she now? Eighteen. She's eighteen. Yes. So for you, having have worked from like the age of ten, um, <laughs> how how are you raising your daughter now? Do you kind of want her to just live 
I guess the normal like child yeah. years and teenage years or are you like now get to work like how your life was do you know what like I wanted to live her life as I say she's going on her first girly holiday tomorrow and I, I just kept saying just enjoy it like mm. have fun she does security um as um as her job wow yeah so she's um getting her full license soon for her security um actually saying that she's actually doing our security for the O2 <laughs> we do hold on, hold on. Your daughter <laughs> is security for Sugar yeah, Babes. She's gonna be our security for the um, for the O2. She's <laughs> so much taller than me. Her hands are like that big. Like she's she's beautiful, but she's just and she's very like she does not give a shit about anything. I love that. So yeah. you're just gonna be walking through the corridor. She'll be like, no. step back from my mum, you know. <laughs> step back from my mum. Always. She's like that when we go out, to be honest. Oh my God. Like she gets me, yeah, I get myself into trouble. She's like, Mum, we're going home. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah. You like gave birth to your built in security guard. Basically, basically, which I just absolutely love because I never knew it was going to go this way because I always sat her down and said, What is it you want to do in life? And she was a, she said, I want to be a paramedic. And anytime someone cut themselves, she was like, oh, I'm going to be sick. And I'm like, you can't be yeah, a paramedic. It's not going to work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not for you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And then now you know, she got a job. She was doing festivals and stuff, just like helping out around the festivals. And now she's doing security. Just so I'm so proud of her. Yeah, it's different. Your life is so interesting. <laughs> like, there's so many things that I want to ask you. Let's, let's start at the moment yeah, that okay. I guess people know you most for like one of the moments mm -hmm. is not even from sugar waves from your solo career oh yeah in 2007 with groove armada song oh, yeah. from what oh, a God. tune like, what was that? talk to them. me about that moment what was that like do you know i just remember getting a phone call and being like uh they want to work with you groove armada wants, wants to work and i was like oh i'm i'm down for that and we went into the studio and there was um, me and another songwriter and we were all just throwing in lyrics and they were like, oh, what should we talk about? And everyone seemed to have thought I was talking about the new replacement of me from the Sugar Waves. And I was like, <laughs> it's really not her. But I was actually talking about another girl sitting in some, you know, your man's car that, who is I don't care who she is. I remember saying I would never ever do a song singing my own name. And there I am singing Mutia. <laughs> <laughs> so I cringe every time I'm like, it's a, a, I love the song. But every time I sing my sing my own name, it's like when I hear Jason Derulo, I'm like, Ooh. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I always laugh and then I remember I've got a song just like that. So <laughs> yeah. So but yeah, they're amazing. They're they're amazing guys. Like it was a, it was an honor to work with them. I mean, it's an iconic tune. Like Thank everybody you. knows it from back in the day. I know it's crazy. What was it like doing that like, after being in the Sugar Babes for so long? Do you know what? I just I I did it because I really didn't think about really doing the, the solo thing. Like I really wanted a break. I, I needed some time for me. But the process of doing the album was a, a nice kind of break for me to kind of still enjoy my daughter because mm. I just had my daughter not too long before that. Um, and then and then being able to be creative at the same time. So obviously when I got the the call and they were like, okay, we want to give you a solo deal. I was like, oh, I don't want people to think I left the group just to be a soloist because that's uh, not what it was. Mm -hmm. um, but I had enough time to to be able to spend time with Tylia and just be like, okay, cool, let me be creative. Because I was like, I've just got a mortgage. I need to pay my bills. <laughs> yeah. And so, so for me, it was perfect timing. I feel like I just needed a little bit of time during the time of having her and, and the sugar babes. I didn't have no time off. Literally gave birth and two weeks later, I was doing push the button video. So it was- What? You yeah. gave birth and two weeks later you're yeah. doing a music video? Yeah. How does that <laughs> even happen? How do you even do that? I know. I was like, we were recording the album and I was breastfeeding like till five in the morning. Like there's a uh, Keisha would hold, hold her while I go in the booth and sing, you know, it's, and, and it was just kind of like, Okay, I need a break. That's why when the the album came up, I, I already had it like a year to just kind of just chill and take some time with my daughter. Did you ever expect that you were going to do stuff on your own when you left? The no, band? I didn't because I I truly felt I felt bad because I thought, oh my god, everyone's going to think mm. if I did do that, everyone's going to think I left because I wanted to do solo, and that was not the case. Um, I just had the opportunity to do it like a year later. Um, and by then, obviously, they had moved on, and there was no going back. So I had no no choice to move for but to move forwards. Yeah, wow, really. 
I want to know about all the moments like behind the scenes that people maybe don't know about. So I'm intrigued to know how the hell you got a record deal so young. Like what happened? How did that happen? So when I met my manager, it's so funny because I met my manager through my dad's. <laughs> oh, how? Because <laughs> my dad worked somewhere around the corner from around his house and they used to always bump heads and they became good friends. And my dad one day just started talking because he used to manage um, All Saints and Gabrielle. Mm -hmm. So my dad used to just talk to him. I was like, oh yeah, my daughter does music. You know, she sings. Um, and he was like, oh, bring her around to my house. Like, let me hear her voice. So, so my dad was like, okay, I'm with you. You know, come back from school. I was like, hey, she's like, we're going to go meet this guy who, um, who's the manager of All Saints and da, da, da. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Big fan of All Saints. I was, I was excited. Um, so I went there, met him, and then sang from him, sang from him, and he was like, cool, let's go into studios. And I remember recording a song at his house that same night. I met what? him. It was weird. Very weird. I know. I'm like, huh? Um, and then, but he already had Siobhan. Recording okay. a solo, solo. So he had um, he had this show thing going on, showcase, and he was like, "Both of you sing." So we both sang our own individual songs, and he was like, "How would you not be like to be a duet?" And we were like, "Okay, let's try." So we went to the studio and we tried to we started a song off together. And I've known Keisha since like the age of eight or nine. Uh -huh. Um, so I was like, "I'm gonna bring my friend with me." And I kind of knew that, I was like, well, I know that me and Keisha sang, sings together in primary school. Ah. So I was like, he asked Keisha, can you sing? Keisha sang and he was like, okay, cool. You're in the group. And we were like, oh, okay, what's going on? And then he's like going, hmm, our sugar babies. And that's kind of how that happened. Wow. And he obviously had a lot of connections with London Records mm -hmm. where All Saints was as well. Mm -hmm. And that was our first label. We went wow. to. Wow. Yeah, and they, they signed us straight away. What a story. Crazy, right? <laughs> it feels like everything sort of just fell into your lap. It in a really, way. really did. I mean, there was a lot of hard work. I mean, mm. you know, we were all very new to it. Like the process of meeting all these strange people in the studios, sitting there till like six, seven in the morning. But yeah, so from that, it kind of just, yeah, that was the first time we got signed. So then when we released Overload, I was 14. It's so interesting because a lot of the time when you hear about people's journey into the industry, they've had like years of a slog. Yeah. Then they get signed. Yeah. Then they start to see the rewards. Yeah. Your story is like everything just happened. Yeah. And then as soon as you made it, then the hard work. Yeah. Kind of started like it in was, the reverse. It did kind of just, yeah. I mean, we're so blessed. It did like fall on our laps to, to, to an extent, but there was a lot we had to do. There's, you know, obviously being so young, mm. There was a lot that we had to, there was a lot we went through. <laughs> yeah, I want to know about that, that lot that you went through. Tell me like a moment that maybe people don't know about, like a negative moment that maybe impacted you and helped shape you that maybe people aren't aware of. I guess starting so young, um, I went through major depression and anxiety. Like I've always been such, I used to be always such a very confident person. Mm. Like even now today, I'm like, oh my God, just loads of people, I get, I get panic attacks. Like, mm. But um, I went through depression for so many years. Like it was very, it was a big, big struggle. And I think during that time, it was so hard. Like I, it's, it's like I trained myself to just just hide everything. Mm. So even the times when I was out working and you know performing on stage, I've been supposed to probably at the lowest of my lows, but I literally just knew how to kind of make it out like I was perfectly fine. And I think that's why a lot of people used to always look at me and be like, oh God, she's like this, she's like that. It's because they just had no understanding that in my head, <clears throat> I was in my own world. And I feel like it was such a struggle to get myself to where I am now. And it just went on and on and on for many, many years. And I just remember thinking, <clears throat> I just cannot wait to the day I feel free. And I feel like today I am in such a such a better space. Like I have my lows at times, but it's not as low as it used to be. Yeah. What know? do you think like triggered that for you? Like at that young age? I, I couldn't even tell you. I guess there was so many things going on in my life. You know, obviously I know that I caught depression from baby blues, having my daughter. That was one thing. And then I feel like, you know, I felt like, I was working a lot and then I was partying a lot. And I think everything together just yeah. wasn't great for me. 
It's like it's such a 360 turn I've done now. Like I'm just like, oh, if I don't go, I'm, I don't sleep as much. But I, I go home. I'm drinking green juices. You know, wow. I'm, I'm going on diets. I'm trying to eat clean and. You know, back then it was like, eat what you want, drink as much alcohol as you want to drink, party as much as you want to party, and, you know, slowly lose yourself. And I feel like I did. Mm. And, but yeah, no, I feel like I've come such a long way. Like, sometimes I sit there and think, oh my God, I'm so proud of myself. Yeah. Because especially at that time, like years ago, you mentioned like baby blues and... Mm -hmm. Back in the day, no one really used to talk about postnatal no. depression or discuss things like that. Well, I didn't know that I suffered with it for like three years without even knowing it. So I just, cause I just kept thinking, why do I feel this way? This is just really like, I, I, I sat in the dark for hours, mm. didn't want to get out of my bed. When I think about the days that I spent so many, so many hours in my beds, I think, what the hell was I thinking? Because I can't now even, I can't stay in my bed for more than two hours. I'm like oh, <laughs> moving around, yeah. you know. But back then, I'd, I could, I literally could sleep till from, I could sleep till late, late at night to the point where it's dark outside already. Wow. Yeah, like depression was. A bitch. <laughs> what was the moment then that you realized that that was what you were experiencing? Um, when I just, when I knew that my mom had to step in and be like, Matia, like, we really need to, you need to get up, get up, get up. And then it just kind of just got to me and I was like, I've got a child, mm. you know, and there would be times when I just literally just wouldn't, I just had no energy no energy to talk, do anything. And I'm a person, I love cooking. Mm. So from the time I know I'm not in that kitchen cooking, <laughs> breakfast, lunch and dinner, I know there's a problem. Mm. So I literally just had to drag myself and, you know, seek help. But also I had great, um, I had people around me that were just amazing. Is there a positive moment you can think of that helped shape your journey and, and who you are? Everything that brings me up is all to do with my family. Mm. Like there's this so in a know, way like your positive moment is having your having daughter. my family yeah, yeah I'm having, having my daughter like I, I feel like she's most probably been my savior to be honest because I, I feel like without her I think my 20s would have been very rock and roll <laughs> yeah I mean they were rock and roll but I think they could have been extreme rock and roll um so I feel like having her just yeah she helped me out a lot how do you think um becoming a mother has, has changed you oh my God, a lot I mean for the best I mean, I did have, obviously, when I when I had her, first had her, I did have a really rocky part. Um, but now I just see everything so positive. Everything's so, like, I just can't wait to do new things with her. You know, also hearing what she's doing instead of me always going on about what I'm doing. You know, she can tell me, yeah, if there's a boyfriend she has in mind or, you know, if there's someone interesting or, you know, what she wants to do next with her life. You know, then I can now concentrate on what she wants to do. Mm. Um, but then at the same time saying that, now that she's 18, I can also now concentrate on what I need to do without having to worry too much. But I do stress about her a lot. Yeah. Because I'm like, oh my God, she's a pretty little thing. I can't believe she's out there. Do you think that's because of who you were when you were that age or? Possibly, and she's like, the total oh. opposite, to be honest. So I feel like I was such a wild child and she is the total opposite. Like, she's good at saving money. I was actually really shit. Mm. Uh, she's like this, just the opposites. But I um, and I feel like the world's a bit crazy today. So I feel like it's it's more like, oh my God, you know, it's more about what someone else is going to do than, than more than what she's going to do. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that the world's more crazy now because I think in particular social media, I mm -hmm. always think back to when I was in school and going to parties and no one had a camera phone. No. No one was posting anything no. online. Exactly. Are you grateful that you had all that success and all of that when that wasn't around? I, I am really happy actually, because I'm like, God, imagine if the camera phones were out and Instagram was out. Your whole life would have been literally on on the internet. I mean, yeah. we, we came from the days where literally MySpace only just was starting to yeah. pop up. Oh that was gosh. so many years ago. <laughs> so MySpace was only just popping up. You know, there was no Instagram. You know, we still had CD players and cassettes. <laughs> And people what were taking time. pictures with their actual cameras, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it was kind of like, I'm so blessed that we got to have that time. Mm. Um, that's why I guess the only we, the only downfall about that was that the newspapers could say what the hell they wanted without having any, you know, a quote from yourself or you going on Instagram Live going, well, actually they're wrong. Mm. So they were able to say what they wanted to back then, whereas now it's kind of different. 
But mm. yeah, I guess, but now everyone's got camera phones and just taking every little bad picture to, oh, yeah, no. Yeah, but what's different is you just you just picked up on a positive thing yeah. about there being social media. Now. Yeah. Like you have the right to reply. Like you could yeah. just hop on an Instagram live. And you can say they're in the wrong, of course. And the amount of times like I've most probably felt like that and everyone's gone, don't do it. Don't do it. I'm like, but please. Don't. They're trying, the to tell, they're trying to make me out to be a dickhead. So I'm like, <laughs> so I'm like, you know, do I go on it? And then, you know, you rant and rave and then they take, and then someone takes what you've said on your live and twists it anyway and puts mm. it back on the newspaper. So either way, it's kind of like, okay, Instagram, you're winning, newspapers, you're not. What was it like being in the Sugar Babes when you were so young and, like you say, having things in the press written about you? What was, what I, was that experience like? I guess most probably that was a part of depression there because, to be honest, I was so young and, and you, you know, you've got grown people sitting, you know, behind computers mm. talking about young kids and speaking about them badly. And I used to always, that was the one thing I used to always say is that, do they not feel bad talking about someone that's under the age of 16 or yeah. under the age of 18? Like, they sit there and actually put us down and they feel no way about it. Yeah. Like, it really shocks me. And it's fine, it's fine now, because I bet they're all in their, like, late 40s and 50s. <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> That's hilarious. You're like, I know who they are now. Yeah, I know yeah, who yeah. these people are. I've met most of these people. But it's like, now I'm just like, like, it's ridiculous. And I would hate for someone to talk about my daughter like that or any any child like that. Mm. You know, like, I'm very protective over kids in general because I've got such a big family. So if anyone spoke about my family or friends or people that of just I'm, what I'm reading about, I'd think, what's wrong with you? Do you like, think having to experience those things so young may, has made you a stronger person? Or do you think it's kind of made you a lot more, I don't know, anxious in older life? Like, how, is, how has that affected you? No, I feel like I, it's so much, a, I'm so much in a positive space right now. Like, I feel like, yeah, they've said some things, but you know what? I can get over them. Because mm. to be honest, I don't have to see none of them. And you know what? If you don't get spoken about, Bad press is good press. Everyone used to say, and I used to be like, what are you talking about? It's bad press. I don't care if you're telling me bad press is good press. Now I'm like, they don't pay my bills, one. I don't have to ever have to see them, two. And to be honest, they've clearly got nothing better else to do. So yeah. can I keep talking? What about the, the people in your life? Because moments in our history shape us, but the people as well are mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, so monumental for us. What about someone in your life, like your personal life? I know you've got such a huge family. Is there one person you can think of that's helped shape who you are? I, I have like five real, real close, close friends mm -hmm. between girls and guys. And they have been most probably my rocks as well. Like besides family, anytime, you know, even when it comes to needing help with picking tracks or coming on show, coming to do when I do my solo shows, mm. you know, or or just, you know, someone sitting me down. I've got one for each thing because they all, they all do different things, you know. It's surprising though to hear because you've got such a big family that like your network is friends, made up of friends. Yeah. That's interesting. Because my, but my, my network of friends are family to me now. Mm. Like these are people that I've known for like 25, 20 odd years. So it's they're they're no longer friends. They yeah. are my family, and they're they're also my family's like my actual family. They are their family too. Because when I'm not about, they go and see my family. They go and see oh. my mum and everything, or they go and chill with my mum. But it's also very admirable, and it says a lot about the relationships you form. Yeah, the fact that you've got friends for such a long time. Yeah, and you started your career so young. Because mm -hmm. I would have thought that would be something really hard to do. Because yeah. you're working in your prime years, like when you make all your your best friends in school and stuff. Yeah, I mean, don't get it twisted. I've I've had to drop out a couple of friends. Um, <laughs> yeah, a few to make of them. Some yeah, 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 yeah. I had to just restart and and start fresh. But the people I have around me now are the ones that I've been friends with or keep as family from like the last 20 odd years. It um, seems that those people, that network have kept you really grounded because yeah. you don't seem to have many friends in your close circle that are in the industry. I don't so. have industry friends. Yeah. I really don't. Um, and it's not because I didn't want to. I have a very awkwardness thing with people from the industry. So really? I really do. Oh, this is interesting. I don't know Tell why. Me about that. I don't know why. Like, um, when I meet people from the industry, besides from yourself. Um, <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. When I meet people from the industry, I have a very awkward feel with it. Like, I don't, like, I know how I feel when people come up to me all the time. And I, I'm not, so I guess I, in my head, I'm like, 
I don't, don't think I'm trying to be like around them or like, I don't know. Oh. I was like, I'm like that, like I'm the fan. So, you, so this is, <laughs> wow. So someone who's been in the industry for as many years as you have, all the success you have, I know. you sort of see it as when you're approaching someone else in the industry, like almost I'm a like fan. you're a fan. Yeah, like I'm in their business and I'm too, I'm too close. So I keep myself <laughs> distance because I know how it feels as well. But it is such an awkwardness. Like I just don't have industry friends. Like wow. I, I've met so many people in my past and even now, but I just won't take their phone numbers. I just- You just keep it very like Very like, hi, bye. Yeah, it was lovely to meet you. Yeah, like, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's great to hear that though, because I think people assume that like everybody in the celeb world, there's oh, this no. kind of notion that, yeah, I don't we're know, all friends. it's like a different realm almost. Yeah, no. And like, everyone's friends. No. And you're going for dinners. Oh, no, no. That's like, not your life. No, I'm very awkward towards it. I'm like, I'm like, okay, they might be thinking I'm just standing there because I'm trying to get a picture or something. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm like, I'm a, I just don't even know. Like, I just don't want anyone. Yeah, I don't. It's it's in between of me feeling like I know how it feels when people are always in your business, and mm. and and then at the same time, it's also a feeling of, oh, this just feels very awkward. It's like, oh, they might, yeah. Let me just keep it moving. Wow. Well, yeah. speaking of like being in that fangirl like moment, is there anybody that hasn't been in your personal life? Maybe like an icon or someone you've looked up to that has inspired you throughout your life? I had the blessings to work with George Michael. Yes. Wow. Um, I grew up with him playing in the household because my mom was a big fan of Wham. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So, and also George Michael went to my high school. Yeah, really? he went to Kingsbury High. Mm -hmm. So he was there for a hot second as well. So I always felt like there was that little connection. And then one day I got a phone call talking about working with him. And I was like, oh, you're lying. Sorry, who makes these phone calls? And you know God people knows. Always, I want to know because <laughs> people always go, yeah, I got a call. Who are these people making these magical well, dream calls? It's funny because the, the I think his management, sorry, his management contacted our management during the time I was with the Sugar Babes. And um, funny enough, my management then had rejected it and said, no, nope, oh. no, she can't do it right now. And I was like, so when I heard, I was like, you rejected me working with George Michael? Rejected George Michael? Right, I couldn't um, I couldn't understand. But then obviously I was working with the girls and I don't know what the conversations was. I just left it and carried on. And then not that long after I'd finished, I had left the group, it's, again, I got a phone call. <laughs> I mean, your phone It's like the magic phone call. It's blessed. Yeah, I had the phone call and they were like, we know that you're no longer with the girls. <laughs> um, so George wants to know whether you want to pursue this 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 song that he's been wanting to do with you. And this was like a few, like a few years later. And I was like, I forgot all about this. And I was like, shit, <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, cool. I love that your life is so fabulous that you forgot that you got a call. Yeah, to with George I did. Michael. I did. I can, it went over my head because I was like, okay, <laughs> this is a bit sad. I couldn't work with him, but okay, let's keep it moving. So then obviously that these calls are coming through and then I got sent the address of where to go to and I, I went to this place and I was like, okay, this is a bit weird. It's like in the like a lot of studios are based in churches. Mm. So I went to this big church. It's a very, very well-known studio actually. And I went in the studio and I was like, what's going on here? And then I saw someone twirling on the chair and it was him. Oh my gosh, it's like a scene out of a movie. Oh my God, it really, it's like the it, shadow. It really, and then he just turned really around. was. <gasps> he was twirling on the chair and, I, and then I slowly like pushed the door open because I kind of had a little peep. And then I pushed the door open and it was him. And he was like, hi, what's your And I was like, hi. What? Yeah, so I spent the whole day with him in the studio um, recording This Is Not Real Love. Um, I was like, you can just tell me what to sing, how to sing it, I will just do it. And he was like, no, I want you to just like sing. He gave, like, he wrote the song mm -hmm. and he was just like, I want you just to put your vibe on it. And yeah, and he was just like, I absolutely love you. And I was like, oh my God, I love you too. And we we became a little, we had a little bond, yeah. What was it like working with, I can't even imagine that, working with someone that you literally heard in your house growing up? It was crazy because um, we recorded the song and then he was getting ready for his tour. And then he was like, can you come to some of the shows? And I was like, oh, hell yeah. So my mum got to give him a big hug, met him. Oh. Yeah, my mom, he was like that. My mum's mom was very, she's like shorter than me. Mm -hmm. And mum was like, I absolutely love you. I was like, mum, stop fangirling. <laughs> 
<laughs> and he could just give my mum a big hug. He was like, I, he was like, thank you for allowing your daughter to be here. And yeah, and my mum was like, oh my God, I love you. I was like, she's like, go away, Matia. Yeah, 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 yeah. I gave birth to you, but move. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, God, yeah, how, like, just, oh, just working with him. Like, sometimes I pinch myself and think, I've been so blessed. Mm. Like, the things that I feel like my life has been going through and what people don't know and what people do know. And, and then one day being able to work with someone so iconic. Yeah. Just, yeah, just maybe, like, sometimes I put, like, my friends play the song and I'm like... Oh my God, that's me. That it's happened. Me. Like that actually yeah. happened. After talking <laughs> to you, it just feels like you've always been at the right place. At the right time. At the right time. Yeah. Like even the sugar babes. I will never forget when I first saw that video for Overload and I was yeah. like, you're, you were so different. Yeah. Like at the time, like girl groups were either like really pretty yeah. or they were like really cool. Yeah. You guys were like, people that I could see myself going to school with. Like yeah. you were like my mate, like the yeah. girls next door. That's what you were like. And your yeah. fashion was so iconic as well because it was just so eclectic, it was so different. Yeah. I can see even sitting here with you today, like you've got a blonde hair, yeah. your makeup's flawless, your nails are oh. like, it's pink, there's glitter, yes. there's a lot happening. Like you're very expressive with, with how you dress now and how you present yourself. I am. And one thing that was quite surprising to me is when you walked in, I was like asking about everything that was going on yeah. with what you're wearing. You told me you do so many courses. Yeah, I do. Just in your spare time. I do, I do. I did a hair course, so I've got a certificate, professionally qualified to do hair. Um, I do nails. I did a, a, a nail course. I did child psychology course. I uh, did tattooing. Wow. Um, anything that's not too, like, I don't have to move around too much. <laughs> Like sit down and do everything you could. Everything I just said, you just have to sit down and do. Uh, that's I love all that stuff. Like I like getting my brain working, and I guess I did. I did all these things just because it was, you know, I had, and it's not even I had time to do it. I just felt like, why not? Why not? And I feel like it's it's kind of it makes up for the lost time that I had not going to college and university. I was going to ask you that. Yeah, yeah. If that was the reason. Yeah, uni, yeah. I, if, if I went to like uni and college, I feel like that would never happened. But because I really, really, I love like reading and and learning new things. It's just always. It, I feel like that's my habit. Like. I have to do things. All I have these qualifications. To... Yeah, I love all of like it. You're a pop star. You're literally on tour, and then it. you're getting a like a course in psychology. Yeah. Like I sit down, <laughs> like with the hair. Like I sat down in a class with my sister. Did it with me as well, and we sat there and we did got a certificate at the end of the day. Did the nail thing. Yeah. So what's the next thing? What's the next course that you're you're gonna? Study? I want to finish off my tattooing. Mm -hmm. Um. So I'm not too far from it. Um. Because I actually I had like couple of weeks off and I actually went to a shop in Essex and I worked in the shop for two weeks. <laughs> yeah. You'd walk in and see me sitting there and I was like cleaning the, I had to learn how to clean everything and I was helping, helping the tattoo artist with all like putting his stuff together. Yeah, 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 I did that because I was like, I've got a couple of weeks off, why not? And I love being around people. <laughs> Got a couple of weeks, so I'm just gonna work in a little yeah, like, like, salon. Yeah, I literally found this place that did course that the course for tattooing, and they had no idea it was me. I just walked in and I was like, "Yeah, have you tattooed anyone yet?" Yeah, I've done my, I, I've, I do myself, and I've done a few of my friends. Wow. Yeah. So one minute you work with George Michael. Yeah. <laughs> you're on stage at the O2. Yeah. And then you're like tattooing your mate yeah. and doing nails and hair. It's, it's so therapeutic. I love it. Wow. I'm just... I know. Full of surprises. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Full of surprises. Mm -hmm. That is exactly what it is. But what I've learned is throughout your whole journey, I feel like you've just had such a solid foundation in your family. Yeah. And your friends. Yeah. And you've always kept yourself very grounded. Very grounded. Like to even hear like that you still want to learn. You're still eager to, yeah. to get qualifications and things like that now at this point in your life. I think it's so important to keep learning and keep knowing, you know, keeping your mind open about things. I feel like when you stop wanting to learn new stuff is that's when life ends. It's like, there's so much more out there to do. You know, eventually like after when we have a little break, I'm I'm flying out and I'm, I'm gonna go learn about another country. Like I, I really, I, and I wanna travel at some point. Wow. I do, I wanna travel Southeast Asia, I do. I mean, it's just never ending. I just no. can't wait to see what you're gonna do I don't do know where this energy you. comes from. That's why I don't hardly sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but your work ethic is like yeah is amazing yeah like, i tell anyone like just 
yeah, just you know, it doesn't matter what you do. Just keep keep an open mind about things. You know, there's so it's a big world out there. Yeah, I mean, one minute you could be in a studio. I want to be a nurse next. Oh, I tell you what, I did want to do. <clears throat> I wanted to be in. I I wanted to do embalming. I know it sounds very morbid. I'm so sorry. What? I wanted to do embalming so bad. Like I I literally would look to look to see whether I could take a see what I had to do. I was willing to actually even go into a funeral home and and work there for a hot second so I can learn. I know. It's very weird. I mean, I do not know where they're going to find you next with you. <laughs> no. Genuinely, I wouldn't write anything no. off. No, I feel like that. I think it's always good to like, you know, singing is my passion and I love singing, but nothing lasts forever. And it's always good to have backup plans and, and other hobbies that, that you enjoy. And I enjoy just learning and new things all the time. Well, there you go. Get yourself mm -hmm. a backup plan. I love Whoever's it. Listening. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, it's coming. Thank you so it. much Matilda, Thank you. for talking to me today. <laughs> what? So if we want to follow your hair, your nails, whatever's going on, what are your socials? <laughs> oh, I'm um, my Instagram's uh, official underscore Matia Buena. And same to TikTok and the rest of it. You find me on Sugar Waves. Well, I'll <laughs> see you on tour. Hopefully I can get a selfie with you if your daughter doesn't block me. Oh my God, no. no, she'll definitely <laughs> let you in. I promise you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Shaping Success, a Simply Be podcast. If you like what you've heard, please give us a follow and a rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to your podcasts. Shaping Success is a Folding Pocket production. <laughs>